encouragement. And so the whole lessons from concept, it actually comes from Pastor Dan. He does this when he goes to different places, lessons from wherever. Uh, and so we wanted to, to glean a little bit of encouragement from our time there. And we're going to take a page from his book and minister a message, Lessons from Central New Zealand. And really, the, the reason we do this is think about Solomon. Solomon was deeply aware of the need for wisdom, wasn't he? If you've ever read the book of Proverbs, or you've ever read through Ecclesiastes, um, what, what he does is he consistently implores us to look to God and others for inspiration and encouragement. Uh, and so he says this, Proverbs 18, 15, intelligent people are always ready to learn. Their ears are open for knowledge. The message paraphrase of the same verse, wise men and women are always learning, always listening for fresh insights. We want to be wise, don't we? And so we can go into different settings and we can draw truth for ourselves and we can gain knowledge and understanding. And, and that's definitely what happened this week. And so we're going to consider just a couple of principles. And what I really want to do is look at three main principles that stood out that will help us individually in our faith, uh, but will also help us in our mission, which is to further the kingdom of God, save souls, and build a church that's healthy and strong for the good of others and the glory of God. Amen? Amen. So we're going to talk about lessons from New Zealand. And we're going to talk firstly, the first principle that we really got from it is powerful worship. Liam touched on that and we didn't talk about it. But one of the principles is powerful worship. Worship is the only thing that God did not give you that you can give to him. Did you know that? Worship is the only thing that God did not give you that you can give to Him. And this is why it really does matter and why God wants it. Because it is our choice to give it. He doesn't worship us and He doesn't give us worship to give back to Him. But we can choose to honor Him and worship Him. One of the first definitions that we find in scripture or the first examples of worship in the Bible is perhaps God asking Abraham for his son Isaac. That's sacrificial, right? And that is ultimately the heart of worship. Worship is all around obedience and sacrifice for God. We know that uh, worship is the praise and worship element of our church service. And we're going to talk about that in more detail in a moment. But true worship is actually obedience and sacrifice and surrender for God. Now, when we're truly aware of the love of God, the goodness of God, the holiness of God, what it should do is it really should trigger worship. Amen. I mean, from within us, there should be something that wants to worship God when we know about His goodness, when we know about His love, when we are having revelation of His holiness and we are living our lives in awe of who He is, it should cause us to want to worship, right? Uh, I know how some of you behave at sporting games. It looks like you're worshiping who's on the field, right? Whoa! Come on, go, go, go. And then you come to church and you're like, for the one who died for you, gave it all in love and wants to provide the holy God, we give him this half-hearted golf clap. Yet your players run out on the court in the field. You lose your breath, right? You throat sore. You come home like, I can't even talk now because I was cheering so hard. For the All Blacks. Saying All Blacks, also keeping it in line with New Zealand tonight. We've got a little video of one of their song services. If we get the sound on for that and get that on as well.
Amen. So it's powerful. That's about 240 people, torrential rain on a Monday night. Oh, but I'm going to miss keeping up with the Kardashians if I go to church on a Monday night. It's raining. And trust me, it's cold. Like it's, it's seriously our winter over there right now. It's bizarre. Come home to this. It's like a sauna everywhere I go in this nation. But listen to the lyrics of what they're singing. All my life you have been faithful. I will sing for the goodness of God. And, and the worship and the passion, honestly, I, I never cry, but I teared up a little bit every single song service as I'm looking out and these teenagers that fill the front rows are just there literally crying with their hands lifted up to Jesus. Teenagers surrendered with their hands up crying in passion worship of jesus that's powerful to me what is it that is causing these people the teenagers all the way through to the more mature grayer haired individuals in the room to be passionately worshiping like that it's a love and a devotion of jesus aren't you glad that when we come, we have a song service team that dedicates and is, practic is practiced and ready to lead us into worship. It's, a, it's an opportunity to connect with God. During praise and worship, do you know what we're doing? We're auditioning and practicing for Australian Idol? No, we're not Guy Sebastian. We're not using church for our gain. <laughs> what we're doing is we're worshiping God. We're lifting up our focus above ourselves and onto Him. That's what we're doing. Isaiah chapter 12, verse 5, Sing to the Lord, for He has done excellent things. This is known in all the earth. Psalms 98, verse 4, Shout joyfully to the Lord, all the earth. Break forth in song, rejoice and sing praises. Psalms 47, 1, Oh, clap your hands, all you peoples. Shout to God with the voice of triumph. Right there, I just answered all the questions you have about why we sing out loud, clap our hands, raise our hands, why we're boisterous in the song service. I just told you from the Word of God. And that's what we should do when we worship God. If we can scream and clap and jump up and down and paint our faces in certain colors for our favorite teams... Surely God is worthy of unrestricted, joyful, enthusiastic, passionate, life-giving worship. With smiles on our faces, I'll throw in for free. Amen? We should be singing with joy during the song service because we are coming into the presence of God. There should be something within us that is excited, that is passionate, they have two song leaders in their church. Both of them are passionate. One of them, the guy just is a worship-holic, worship-holica. Is that a term? Worship-holic. Alcoholic, but worship. He just, like, he just is so addicted to it. He's just like, oh, he's, and he just gets so pumped that he's like, his head's gone back like this. He's like, yes. He's just worshiping God. I'm just watching it. I'm like, yes. That's what we should do when we're coming into the presence of God. And it becomes contagious. It bleeds out from the platform into the congregation. It becomes like a, like a, a good disease that just spreads through the building. And then everyone's worshipping. It's a great thing. You know, each of us, when we come to church, we need to learn how to lift our hearts above our troubles. Because there's going to be days we come and we don't, we don't naturally feel physically like worshipping. Our legs are sore, we're tired a big day but can you lift yourself above your troubles for 12 minutes and worship the king of kings worship the lord of lords with all that is within you when we come to church we may have troubles and concerns about life but we've got to choose to worship in fact i'll go as far to say it as this it's got to become a conviction you have a deep conviction I will worship God, rain, hail, or shine, no matter what's happening. He is worthy of my worship, not just because of his goodness he's given me, but because he is good himself, his nature, his character, who he is, is worthy of my praise. You see, when we praise and we worship, it releases faith, which takes us into God's presence and God's power. With faith, all things are possible. Your praise, your worship brings you into the presence and the power of God. 
He inhabits the praises of his people. Where does God live? The praises of his people. And when you praise and you worship and you sing from your heart and you don't care what people think around you and you lift up his name, you personally, other people might stay defeated, but you personally can be ushered in to the presence and power of God. Can I just encourage you? Never be ashamed to worship. Now, don't be silly and a distraction to others where you get on your chair and you're slapping people and you're down the front doing the worm and, and all sorts of weird things. It's about you. You put your shirt off. And you, don't do that. But can I just encourage you, lift up your hands in worship. I know some people are shy. They're like, oh, if I lift my hands, people think I'm weird. So you start out at the penguin and slowly move it up to here. So. You can do it. No one's going to think less of you. And what you're doing is you're coming into the presence and the power of God. And in his presence, there's healing. There's anointing. There's dominion. There's salvation. There's deliverance. Powerful worship, it sets the tone for a church service. Now, we've prayed beforehand, and we had great prayer meetings in New Zealand as well. And we pray in our church, in all of our churches, for an hour before we begin our services because prayer makes a difference. But the first thing that we do before we get to the Word and all of the other things that we have scheduled and planned is we worship God because we want to, to enter His presence and His power before anything else. It makes the difference in a service. And let me say this as well, it's a key to growth. A good worship service is a key to good church growth. People can come in and they can see your passionate worship and they want to know the God that you worship like that. Why are you worshiping the way you're worshiping? The God that you're serving must be a good God. You know, I went to a primary school called St. Patrick's in Nanango for about five, six years. I don't even know how long. Primary school, however long that is. Most of it. You know what we were told every time we went to our weekly mass? I was never a Catholic, but I went to a Catholic primary school. When we walked through, they're like, shh, don't make any sound in the church. And we had to sing these boring songs, and they, we had to sing them really quietly for some reason. When you sing, I thought you were supposed to sing loud. They're like, sing them quietly. And they would, the teachers would death stare us if we make any noise in church. If, if, we were, like, if we smile, put that smile away. There was this disdain for any sense of joy in God's house. So for me, I'm like, this is weird. Can I just say, there is no restriction like that here. We don't have any nuns that are going to beat you for smiling during the song service. Okay? Not that I know of anyway. We're not going to criticize you for wanting to worship God with smiles and joy. We're not going to criticize you for clapping your hands or lifting them up in worship, for having a bit of enthusiasm when you're worshiping. We're not going to, we're not going to ridicule you. In fact, we celebrate that because, listen, that's a key to growth. When I grew up in, the, in the, the, the Catholic primary school, I never once wanted to know the God that these people served because they didn't worship him very well, therefore he mustn't be that great. People ought to come and see our worship service and go, man, can you feel that? They don't even know what it is, but what it is, it's the presence of God. They feel the power of God. They look around and they're like, why are they crying right now? Did somebody say something offensive? But then they'll begin to have revelation. Man, they are so in awe of God. I want to know that God. That's what our worship can do. It's a key to growth. When the team of dedicated music musicians or vocalists live consecrated and they allow the holiness of God to flow through them. Listen, that's powerful. When a church understands the heart and the power of worship, and the church at large engages personally, participates personally in worship, that's powerful and that's a game changer. I want to talk secondly about prioritizing hospitality. Powerful worship is a game changer. Prioritizing hospitality is another lesson learned and a key that stood out to me in New Zealand. Hospitality is a universal ministry, isn't it? We all love company and we all love food don't we? doesn't matter your background. Hospitality speaks all languages. We know some people, um, you know, might stereotypically be, be really gifted in that space. But listen, hospitality is a universal language. You can be Australian and serve up a barbecue. 
right? You can be Tongan and serve up horse, as they did for me on Wednesday night. Tasty. You can be Lebanese and do, you know, meat on a stick, kebabs, I don't know, right? It's a universal thing. The definition of the word hospitality, it's the practical expression of love, service, generosity, and entertainment of guests. That's the definition. And when we prioritize as a church, the practical expression of love, service, generosity, and entertainment of guests, that makes a difference. That makes an impact. Paul said to the church in Rome, Romans 12, verse 9 to 13, don't just pretend to love others, really love them, hate what is wrong, hold tightly to what is good, love each other with genuine affection, and take delight in honoring each other. Never be lazy, but work hard and serve the Lord enthusiastically. Rejoice in our confident hope, be patient in trouble, and keep on praying. When God's people are in need, be ready to help them. Always be eager to practice hospitality. Paul said this to the church in Rome. Hey, prioritize hospitality. Always be ready to practice hospitality. Again, what is it? It's the practical expression of love and service, generosity, entertainment of guests. Paul's saying to the church in Rome, hey, if you're going to make a difference, if your church is going to break through, if you're going to make impact, always be ready to display love, service, hospitality. This is what he's saying. There was a running joke through the week. Every night after fellowship, we would get in the car. And go, oh, I'm never eating again. And Pastor Dan would know exactly what I'm talking about. Because that's what we said every night. Why? Because people, man, they were eager to practice hospitality. That They were eager to, to display practically love and service and generosity and entertainment of their guests. Every night after fellowship, I ate so much food. Oh, I gained weight. You won't tell, but I did. And, and do you know what? It wasn't just food. It was the heart in which the service was given. Honestly, I was moved, almost embarrassed sometimes. We walk into houses and they, and, and, and yeah, South Auckland is not a third world nation. It's not Africa. It's not, you know, the, the jungles of Papua New Guinea. But I want to tell you, it, it's not Australia either right? Those houses aren't like Australian houses. They're paying 800 bucks a week for a granny flat, $2.90 a litre on petrol, and they're not making a lot of money. But they, you walk into houses, they've rearranged it to host us. They've moved the couches over there. They've, they've, they've put the table over there. They, they've moved, you know, the kids up the back somewhere in the corner. Get out of here! You know, they, uh, and then they get, they got trestle tables out. They've got tablecloths. They've got the food station over there. They've got the chairs from somewhere. I don't know, uh, but, but it's, it's set up, man. And you walk in and it's all arranged and they greet you. And then before they pray over the food, there's like this big speech. It's like they've welcomed this dignitary to their house. It's like they've rolled out the red carpet for this tall white guy. And every night it's like, we are so privileged to have you here. I'm like, I feel, I feel, I feel awkward. By, by, the, by the display of love, the humility that they have to, to host us in their house, knowing it's actually a blessing to do that for people. They, 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 they got it. And so they're like, hey, thank you so much for coming. Thank you, Mary. Thank you, Estelle. Thank you, Ava. Thank you, Pastor Dan. Oh, the, the revival, God's move. And there's this big speech and this big grand opening ceremony for the dinner. And then they pray over the food. And every night after, you know, they finish praying. Everyone's like, gives God a clap offering. It's like they're opening up a church service. And all we're doing is eating some KFC and some Asian food and some horse. But it was very moving. It was very humbling. And I'm not even exaggerating and joking when I say they did make me horse. I said I was a Tongan and so he got me a horse. And one of the men in the church, Gunny, 
And, you know, for those that, that love it, it, you know, it's wrapped and it's like, it looks like pulled pork. I wouldn't have known it was horse. It's got some sort of spicy sauce on it. Mm. I got a huge amount. Turns out the amount I got was for three men. But, I, but you know, I'm, I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm going to eat all of it because I want to show Gunny. Like, I got this. <laughs> like 20 minutes in, I'm like, oh, man. Is it rude to take my pants off? <laughs> And he's like, hey, you know, Pastor, that's for three people. I'm like, oh, who wants some? <laughs> Only had a little bit left. But you see, when it comes to hospitality, the lesson here is when we prioritize hospitality, it allows connection of heart and it allows relationships to be strengthened. The lesson isn't just that we would, you know, eat a lot of food. The lesson is that when we prioritize hospitality, what we do is we create an environment that allows a connection and a knitting of heart and relationships to be strengthened. That's incredibly important in a church setting. We want to have a church that's united, a church that is growing in relationships, a church where hearts are knitted together. That happens as we prioritize hospitality. Hospitality cultivates a sacrificial service and love that really does make an impact on those around us and those that we host. It made an impact on me. No doubt it made an impact on Liam. John chapter 13, 35, by this all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. First Peter 4, 9 and 10, be hospitable to one another without grumbling. Bring your own food. as each one has received a gift minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of god so for us as people if we're if we're going to have influence long-lasting influence with people we've got to prioritize hospitality amen it's a key to church growth and discipleship in the book of acts think about it it went from 120 people to 3,000 people in one night that's pretty rapid church growth they have one church service, they've got 120 people. The next church service, 3,000 people. And the Lord added to the church daily, so that number was going up. That's pretty radical. Amen? One of the keys to their retention in their church building process was hospitality. The Bible tells us they broke bread, they live with each other, sell everything. Hey, move in my house. we got some space. Isn't that a thing that happens in certain places in the world? I saw it happen over there in, the, in, in New Zealand. I was going to say the islands. In New Zealand, new converts living with people in these small houses. Hey, you can move in with me. Hospitality. It's a huge part of church growth. Now, I know that our church, we have a great fellowship culture. We have a great hospitable culture here in this church, and it's a great thing. Let's continue it. But I want to encourage you that as we continue to grow, one of the keys to our effective influence is learning to not just go to a restaurant where it's noisy, but invite people into your homes. That is a key to then being able to make an impact on somebody in a setting where there can be a knitting of heart and there can be a forming of deeper level of relationships. That can happen in your home. So here's the question. When was the last time you had me over for dinner? <laughs> or somebody else over for dinner? Because there's a knitting of heart that happens in that setting. And it is an absolutely powerful, impactful thing that you can do to deepen your relationships. And instead of viewing it as a burden, we've actually got to view it as an incredible opportunity to make an impression and an impact on somebody. It's a privilege to be able to show love and generosity and service, to be hospitable to those around us. So the second lesson was prioritizing hospitality. The last one, and we close with this, is purposeful leadership. Purposeful leadership. So we've spoken about powerful worship, prioritizing hospitality. And lastly, we're going to talk tonight about purposeful leadership. One of the things that they did on the Sunday morning was they announced their connect groups for 2024. And so uh, their church pretty much runs through connect groups and they have eight connects, connect groups, eight assistants. 
And Pastor Dan specifically asked before I got there um, that I would speak in light of that topic, um, servant leadership specifically. And it was, it was an amazing experience to see the way that they dignify serving the kingdom. There was such a, a deep sense of admiration for those that were serving, but also a, a, an appreciation for the opportunity to serve. So we have a picture here of Pastor Dan and some of the people on the stage. You can't see all of them. There were 16 couples on the platform. Um, and so that's 32 people on the platform. And this was after they, they did the, the young men. And these were what they called the unofficial leaders. So there's the, the connect leaders. They have assistants. And then there's these unofficial guys. These are guys who are just uh, developing leaders. They're growing into, into roles, aspiring for great things. They're all single guys. And as Liam said, they're all young. I think it was like six to eight of them or something like that. Uh, and these are all guys serving in different ministry capacities already. Um, but now they're going to be helping serve within these connect group settings. And what they did is it's very similar to our conferences. If you've ever gone to a conference, we plant churches. And so our, our framework, it's evangelism, discipleship, church planting. And we plant out couples into the ministry. They begin churches in different locations. And when we plant a church at a conference, they'll announce them. They'll, they'll, everyone will cheer. They'll come to the platform. And that couple is leaving their local church, going somewhere else to start a new one. Powerful. And we celebrate, rejoice that. It's the highlight of our conferences. And so they've adopted that framework as they announce connect groups. They'll announce... A, a couple and an assistant that are beginning that are going to be connect group leaders and they'll, they'll cheer and everyone's pumped and excited and rejoicing and celebrating and they'll come and they'll stand there and they get given a towel with their name embroidered on it and the towel represents Jesus washing the disciples feet leadership is all about servanthood and Pastor Dan, he said the comment at the conclusion before he prayed for these couples. And he said, these people are the standard. You can look to them. You can ask for their help. They're here for you. And it was a powerful moment. And people are on the platform. And that, I want to tell you that some of them were crying at the opportunity to serve. And we went to people's houses and the towel that they got with their name embroidered on it, some of them had them in cabinets in their house. Some of them are going to frame these towels with their name on it. And you walk in and instead of seeing, you know, all of the things that people worship, right, there's a towel there. And it's a reminder, this is my value system. I'm a servant. That was, that was impactful to me. I'm going to ex-gang members' houses, people who spent time in prison, and there's a towel in a cabinet. This is a new creation in Christ. My value system now is to serve the kingdom. Other places, it's right there. You walk through, it's got a picture of their family and it's got the towel. Just like, whoa. Man, these people, it's convicting. How many know every area of life flourishes when people lead purposefully? Think about it. Leadership is not a title or position. It's an action and it's an example. These people were given roles of connect leaders, but they weren't put in it to be given a title or a position. But these people are the standard, as Pastor Dan said. And their leadership is going to be displayed through action and exampleship. And the heart of Christian leadership must always be around the towel. It is servant orientated. That's what leadership really is. The world system is self-focused but the kingdom of God is God-focused and others-focused we don't serve for self we serve for others we serve for the glory of God amen that is purposeful leadership within the kingdom Jesus said in Luke 12 27 those who are the greatest among you should take the lowest rank and the leader should be like a servant isn't that powerful you know I love the the old stories of Richie McCaw again New Zealand night of Richie McCaw sweeping the sheds after games. While all the boys are out getting, getting on beers, right? There's Richie McCaw sweeping up all their strapping tape, picking up the rubbish and throwing it in the bins. Perhaps the greatest all black, the most revered player, 
serving the team. In fact, that's what made him great and made their team great because he had a heart for service and a heart of humility. He didn't forget where he came from. He knew who he was at his roots and he knew that with his responsibility of leading that team, he needed to lead by example when it came to serving. That's what Christian leadership is. It's, it's serving and doing things behind the scenes when no one's looking. It's sacrifice, it's early starts, it's late nights, it's away from comforts. And many times, it's in arenas where there's no recognition and no appreciation. Amen? Purposeful leadership is a key to support our community and our church. If we would embrace this mindset, we'll make a massive difference. I want to throw some rapid fire things out at us because purposeful leadership is very important. And people that rise into elements of leadership that serve in ministry, they view it as a privilege. Amen? Which is, which is why I just said, you know, the concept of the Tao, it's a reminder that, that I'm here to serve but the heart that I saw in some of these people to, to frame it or put it in a cabinet, that displays to me an awareness that this is a privilege. The fact that I get to be in ministry or serve God, this isn't a given. It's like, oh, fine. Yeah, I've got talent. I may as well. That's like, this is a privilege, man. God doesn't need us. He doesn't. God can bring people like that. God, God can give over and above. He can get the job done, but he chooses to use us. We've got to shift our perspective and view it as a privilege, not a right. Not I exist and I may as well do something and I'm talented. I can sing, I can play guitar, I can play drums, I can do backflips. I can do it. Doesn't matter what you can do. You've got to view it as a privilege, man. Purposeful leaders understand ministry and leadership is a privilege and therefore they willingly embrace the responsibilities connected to that. Because yeah, it is a privilege, but there are some responsibilities connected. They're the first people in the prayer room because they're setting the tone. They're the leaders. If prayer's at five, they're there at five. They don't come in at 545. They're the purposeful leader. They're the ones setting the tempo, setting the tone. If the leader doesn't do it, do you really think other people will do it? If, if the leader isn't doing it, do you really think the new convert is going to capture the vision for prayer? Right? Purposeful leaders, they view it as a privilege. I'm doing something for God, so I'm going to embrace the responsibilities. Right? They have a heart for the Word of God. Purposeful leaders have a burden for souls, a burden for evangelism. They understand the need to reach the lost. They're engaged in worship and hospitality. These things I mentioned a minute ago. There's displays of sacrifice and love. They, they want to be in God's house. They're committed to their role of ministry. Amen? If people only start doing things in commitment because they have the position, they're never going to sustain it. It's got to overflow from actual desire. Man, I want to be in God's house. I want to be committed to this. If you're propped up just because of position, you won't be sustained. You got to check your heart. Is it in me? Do I want this? Because if not, and you're only doing it out of obligation rather than devotion, it's not a healthy way to live. This is what makes people begin to become uncomfortable. Purposeful leaders are accountable, they're teachable, and they're aware that their example has influence on those around them. Amen? They're actively trying to add value and inspire others to strive for excellence and for good things. That's what purposeful leaders do. A servant leader, a purposeful leader is someone who looks for opportunities to rise up and fill a gap. They see serving as an opportunity, not obligation, a blessing, not a burden, a privilege, not a problem. Amen. I've had to constantly go back to place a place of humility and thank God for the opportunity to serve him. I started as an usher cleaning the toilets, straightening chairs. I thanked God for that, man. Thank you, God. You'll use a wretch like me. 
we ought to view it as a privilege. You know, when I look out at this room and I say it all the time, this church, I said it just a minute ago, it has all the ingredients for a powerful world-changing church. All the ingredients. Sure, we're talking about some lessons from New Zealand and we're looking at some of the things that stood out that were impactful while we were there. We talk about their powerful worship and the prioritization of hospitality and the purposeful leadership. And those things are great. But I want to tell you, all that's here in just a miniature version. All it takes is some watering and some some rearranging and some tightening and some people willing to embrace some things. And I want to tell you, things begin to bloom and unfold, take on new life. That was one of the standout things with the purposeful leadership I noticed in that church. So many times I said to Pastor Dan, hey, what's the thought behind that? Or where did you, where did you get that? Or what is that? Where did you purchase it? And what did, what's this? And how did you do that? And he's like, I don't know, man. That's that person's job. That's that person's ministry. That's that team's duty. And I remember, as Liam said, the first revival I did there, I preached a sermon when he was the song leader on the keyboard, just him. I think he might have had two 15-year-old backup singers there as well. And it's in New Zealand. They're all Islanders. So it can just be one dude singing, but the harmonies in the crowd. Oof. The song service is amazing. Even without instruments, they can just do a cappella, and it sounds incredible. But here's the thing. I preached this sermon and I, I, I got these teenagers to stand where there were vacant instruments. He had them on the stage, but no one was playing them. They could play them. But you know what? They didn't want to live at a, a level that qualified them to play it. They wanted to keep being casual Christians. So I got them there and they, they got, gave them a bit of a feel. But I, I made the statement and I said, Pastor Dan was sent to New Zealand to make disciples and plant churches and preach the gospel, not song lead for the rest of his life. And I think it wasn't my words, but somehow the Holy Spirit latched onto that and it penetrated hearts and people began to rise up and see, you know what, if I serve in this role, it allows that person to serve in that role. It releases them to focus more on that. And what ha- ends up happening is there's a multiplication of effectiveness as people dedicate to their roles. Man, I'm all in on this. This is my job and I'm going to own this job and I'm going to be the best at this job. And when everyone has that mindset, you know what happens? <laughs> Things explode. And I'm standing at the back of the church in Central and there's people over here and they're doing this and there's people over here and they're having little team meetings and then there's this group over here taking care of that. I'm just like, this is like a well-oiled machine. This is a a weapon that's going to wreak havoc on the kingdom of darkness for the glory of God. And that's because of powerful worship. They prioritize hospitality and purposeful leadership. And all of those things are lessons that will help us in our faith, but also our church continue to press into all that God has. This is a great church. And I want to tell you, we are going to make a huge impact for the glory of God. And we're going to raise up disciples. We're going to plant churches. We're going to do things uh, for the glory of God. Uh, And and these are some lessons that can inspire and trigger our faith for those things in the future. Amen. I mean, let's bow heads and close our eyes. Just in respect to those around.